God created us for relationships, and yet relationships can be quite difficult. That's why we're talking about God's wisdom in human relations. God's love, elevating, energizing, empowering. Miracles happen when you know that you are loved. Peter Youngren has communicated God's love with millions from every religion and culture. Get ready for your ultimate life because you are loved. Well, thank you for being with us today. I don't think there's anything closer to our heart than human relations. You know, human relations bring us so much joy, but can also bring a lot of pain. And so we are uh, offering you this teaching album today, Live a Better Story, God's Wisdom in Human Relations, Pastor Nathan Thurber and myself, five hours of teaching on this subject. And we want you to have that. We'll show you throughout the program how you can receive it. Today, we're gonna pick up where we left off yesterday. Uh, but first, you know, we always want to keep it front and center that God has done something for you. So before we go to that teaching segment concerning uh, human relations and God's wisdom, uh, I want to remind you again about what Jesus has done for you. And I'm going to do it via one of our Jesus in threes. You know, every week I release a little nugget statement, no more than three minutes, where I say something very important about Jesus. You can see it on my Facebook, or you can see it on our, on our website. Every, every week you can see a, a new message come up. And here's one of the messages I recorded while driving my car a little while ago. Well, this week's Jesus in three comes right from my car, and my director and producer is none other than Tyna Youngren sitting right beside me here. And uh, I was thinking about prayer in the light of Jesus' finished work. Jesus has already provided everything that we need. So how do we pray? Obviously, prayer is not begging or pleading with God to do something that he's already done. So how do we pray? You see, for many people, prayer is uh, spending some time telling God what God should do. Sometimes among charismatic Christians, uh, people spend time telling the devil to back off and what he should do. Uh, you know, my late friend, Dr. T.L. Osborne, told me uh, one time when we were talking about this many years ago, he said to never ask God to do what he has already done. And uh, then he said, never ask God to do what he has empowered us and asked us to do. Well, that piece of advice to many might ruin their prayer meeting. They're saying, what in the world should I be praying about? Because we tell God, let your power come. God send the fire. God shake our city. God move, etc., etc., etc. And then, as I said, some men, the charismatic friends, they spend equal time with the devil saying, back off, devil. Devil, we know what you're up to. And they're kind of having a conversation with the devil. So in the light of the fact that the devil is defeated, that Jesus Christ has already given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, and that all those things are available to us through the knowledge of what Jesus has done. So how are we supposed to pray? I find that prayer is, and I mean prayer time, not, not the prayer without ceasing. There is a way that we pray continually in our spirit, but prayer time is synchronizing my thoughts with God's thoughts. I find that very often uh, my way of thinking or, or, or the circumstances around me, uh, they, they distract me. So I forget God's thoughts right in the, in, the, in the situations that I'm facing. I forget what God has done for me. I forget Jesus' finished work. So prayer time is a time where I get to synchronize my thoughts and I get to think, oh, I've been thinking like this and this. But that is not in line with Jesus' finished work. So that thought has to fall by the wayside. And, or, or I think, oh, I had this idea, but I can see this doesn't line up with the finished work and the full revelation of Jesus Christ. So let it go. And so I come out of my prayer session strengthened and saying, God is with me. Thank you, God, for reminding me of what you have done for me. And I'm ready to face life. Why don't you practice some prayer like that today? Well, it's very powerful to align our prayer with the finished work of Jesus. So we're not grasping, trying to get God to do something. We're not trying to get God to perform something. We are, we're merely 
receiving and taking a hold of what God has already done for us. And so I hope you'll uh, check out on peteryungren.org uh, the different uh, messages we send like that, just a little to, to, to boost, boost your day and, and help to turn your attention to Jesus because there's a lot of things that can certainly sidetrack us away from Jesus Christ. Well, with all that, uh, call the Grace Prayer Center if you want someone to agree with you in that kind of a prayer where we focus on what Christ has already done for you and receiving that. Now, I want to just recap what we touched on yesterday. I took the story of the first miracle that Jesus performed, which was not inviting someone to be born again, and it was not a miracle of healing. You know, it was not one of those great healing of a leper or something, all that, that would have been wonderful. But Jesus' first miracle was literally helping a social situation. Uh, they were running out of wine at a wedding. How embarrassing that would have been and how that could have, um, you know, strained the relationship between the caterer and the bridegroom and the bride and the parents of, the, uh, uh, of those who were the bridegroom and, 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 and the bride. And, and Jesus is interested in that. Jesus is helping that social situation. It, it encourages me greatly. Jesus is interested in your social relations. He's interested in helping you in your social life. And then I talked about what can make the wine run out of a relationship. And uh, let, let me just, because I have it right here, I put the very first thing, unrealistic expectations. You know, people in their marriage and the business relationship know what the expectations are. So we talked about that a little bit, uh, applying God's wisdom in that area. Now, here we go for some more teaching. What makes the wine run out in our relationships? Unwarranted comparisons. I wish you were like my mom my dad, or even worse, my ex. Oh, if you really want to get in trouble. I'm so, you know, Tina's father is a tremendous handyman. He can fix anything. He built several houses from scratch. He can do anything, and I can almost do nothing. I mean, it's, it's almost ridiculous. I laugh at it myself sometimes, you know. I, I mean, in, in our home, Tina tends to want to hang the pictures on the wall herself because I have to drill too many holes before I made it right. It's it, it just, so I let her do it. I just, I just pretend it, it's no big deal. Well, I'm the, I'm the man. I should do, no, what, whatever. That, that works good. She's happy. I'm happy. Sometimes, you know, I can be so unpractical that it's, it, it embarrasses me. We were driving our car, was not the car we have now, just, just before we, we traded the car, and, and we had all this thing in our trunk, and I'm trying to tie down the trunk. And I had such a complicated system to tie down the trunk, and as soon as we drive another kilometer, and the trunk flips open again. And I go back there and do it my way. And finally, Ty says, you know, let, let me give you a little thought. And when I saw what she saw, I thought, this is ridiculous. I don't want to talk about this ever again, and we basically have until right now, but that's okay. So, so, so uh, can you imagine the pressure if I had to try to be like her dad? Come on, set people free. Everybody is unique. Do you know that? It's same in the work situation. Well, I wish you were like my last employer, or I wish you were like, you know, this person who worked here. I found one thing. Every human being is totally unique. In one sense, None of us are replaceable. But in another sense, we're all replaceable. You know, because if you go to a cemetery, you see all these stones, and they're all commemorating irreplaceable people. So in one sense, none of us are replaceable because you can never find a person who's exactly like you. I found that working with many people. You know, somebody's working in the ministry with us. And they have certain talents. And then that person, for whatever reason, moves on or retires. Like we had, maybe people retire, they're just getting too old. You know, we got to, uh, they, they, they're not, they're beyond their working years. And, and, and so, how can I replace this person? You can never replace that person. But you can find another person who replaces some of the things. And then they usually can do some other things that that person didn't do. And then you shift things around. So every one of us unique. 
And, you know, God's grace helps me to accept people as they are. I just smile. I said, no, you know what? It works. It works because God's put it together and because we are who we are. And we can't just take our thing and transplant it over here without other people being exactly the same. And that's not going to happen. So thank God we are all unique. And so you accept yourself and you accept others. You don't have to be like somebody else. I don't have to be like somebody else. I don't compare myself with somebody else. You know, they say, oh, I wish I was like this person. Oh, I wish I had a minister like that. Why? Oh, I wish I you know, had this. No, you are you. And God's grace, when you see that I'm so accepted in the beloved, I'm so loved by God, you can say, amen, I am who I am. Here, quickly, let me, let me give you something else that makes you, can make the wine run out. Self-pity. Oh, she doesn't understand me. No, she does understand you. you you're not, let me say this to you. The person who you live with is the one who understands you the most. <laughs> Warts and all. All the married couples can just nod and the others can just be in wonder. All right? So self-pity is this. It's, not, it's when I don't see myself blessed. I feel sorry for myself and I want to draw attention to myself you know, that can be very tiresome. Thank God for his grace that lifts us out of that abyss. And I don't feel sorry for myself because I'm the blessed of God. I have Christ in me. That's what we teach. I don't believe the lie that I should feel sorry for myself and I blame everybody else and it's my parents' fault and it's this person's fault. No, I am a child of God. I'm a joint heir of Jesus Christ and it so fills my belief that I don't feel sorry for myself. Here's something else. Hidden agendas. I used to say like this, if you marry a couch potato, he will not turn into an entrepreneurial wizard in three weeks with your mentoring, dear lady. You know, whoever you marry is who you marry. That's right. People don't change. In fact, they may camouflage some before, so, so if the one you're marrying has bad breath before you get married, it'll really be worse after <laughs> because they're trying. So, you know, the idea of trying to change someone can make a relationship very tiresome. It brings this pressure. I've, I've seen this, and your job may be different. I've seen that some very spiritual ladies, very spiritual ladies, sometimes they're trying to make their husband into a pastor. You can take a beautiful man of God who is not a pastor, he's just a person in the church, beautifully committed, and there's so much pressure, and then he tries to do something he's not meant to do, and, and it becomes a very unhappy situation. It's a hidden agenda. Let me say something to you. You know the most spiritual thing in the world you can do is not to be a pastor anyhow. M my job isn't more holy than your job. We're all the children of God. We're all equal before God. So, so you, you think about yourself, different things, hidden agendas. Here's something. Here's a big one. Emotional manipulation. Ooh, I, did, did you hear that? There was a wave that hit there. The wave hit the auditorium. Emotion. I'm not saying you can't express your emotions. In fact, I used to have some very good friends. They've gone on to be with the Lord and they were ministers, and the lady would always say, she said this almost every time she preached, oh, my husband and I, we have a, such a perfect marriage. We have never had one disagreement in 25 years. They kind of married late. I used to think, no wonder he's sleeping when you're preaching. Uh, you know, to have a disagreement is not such a bad thing. It means you're not repressing your emotions. Usually, if you've never had one disagreement, it's because the one person is totally dominated by the other, or you're both lying. You know, the fact that you, have, that you express yourself, and I'm not talking, when I talk about emotional manipulation, I don't mean that you don't say, oh, that makes me sad, or that makes me upset, or I don't agree with this. No, you talk openly about things. What I mean with emotional manipulation is that we use emotions, often without saying anything, to exert influence and control over other people. So we, we kind of can be moody or give the silent treatment. It's getting real silent here now. 
Like, like, what's wrong? Oh, nothing. Oh, nothing. Well, well, you seem strange. Oh, no, there's nothing. And so you create this, this tension. You create this, this wall. You know, God's love has set us free from that. Now, let, let me show you a person in the Bible who was an emotional manipulator, all right? Look at this person here. He, he, was, he was sick. And, you know, sickness can, can be used in different ways. And then he came for healing. So we read in 2 Kings 5, 9 to 12. Naaman stood at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that Elisha would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Now, that's one form of emotional manipulation, to go off in a rage. He just stomped out of there, slammed the door, and I said, I've had it with that preacher because I don't like. See, see, what he wanted was, he wanted Elisha to say, oh, what an honor to have you, mighty general, come and visit me. Where shall I touch you? Where is the leprosy? Let's, uh, shall we touch it a little bit there to make you feel better? But you see, it, 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 Elisha, teaches us something very beautiful here. He wasn't affected by emotional manipulation. He, he didn't run out, oh, oh, oh wait, wait, Naaman. Na I, I didn't mean it like that. Oh, oh, let's talk. He just let him go. Let him go. Why? Because he loved Naaman. He wanted Naaman healed. And he knows that making a fuss and, and, oh, how are you doing? Oh, I, didn't, I hope your feelings aren't hurt. That actually doesn't help Naaman. It, it actually rewards emotional manipulation. Friends, the gospel of the grace of God sets us free from this. Knowing how much God loves us sets us free from this. And, and I want to say to you, you should always in every relationship know that everybody should know I'm open to talk. I'm open to share. Always be open to talk. Never shut the door, but don't cater to manipulation. Don't make a fuss or, oh, you know, somebody's like looking very moody and angry and slamming the door. You say, oh, I better be careful now. Don't, don't be careful. Just walk around and say, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You don't have to be grumpy. Well, well uh, but they're sending vibes. Well, you start sending vibes back that you are very happy. Yabba dabba do. I'm so happy Jesus Christ lives in me. Now, you don't flaunt it like that, but I'm saying you, you don't let yourself. Uh, what, what do you think Elijah did? Or what, what do you think Elisha did? Excuse me, I always mix those two guys up, Elijah and Elisha. I don't know if you have the same problem. What did Elisha do? He said, oh, I can't believe what did I do? Oh, what an opportunity. He probably brought a big offering with him as well, you know, being a big general and all. He had a big entourage. Anyhow, the Bible describes his big entourage. I, I don't know. I kind of blew it. What, what do you think? He said, well, what do you think? No, he didn't. There's no indication of that. So Elisha here is a picture of a person who is securing God. Now, we love everybody. We love everybody, but we want to say emotional manipulation, you know, let's cast that aside. We have Jesus Christ. Well, the, the bottom line here is that Jesus demonstrates by turning the water into wine that God is interested in helping you in relationships, in social situations. And so I, I would say with that as a background, if you are an emotional manipulator, for example, you may not want to call the Grace Prayer Center and say, I'm an emotional manipulator, but maybe you are. Or maybe you are on the receiving end of emotional manipulation. Either way, God wants to help you. God is interested in turning your water into wine. He, he's interested in to put the joy and the abundance and the fullness back in your life. And then uh, we're going to pick up this teaching tomorrow, but I just want to say I cannot touch on the story of Naaman the leper which you saw him as an, as an emotional manipulator here, which I, I think the Bible kind of describes it as. Of course, he did change. He did, he did go along with God's plan. So I want to say that he received healing, a powerful healing story. He was a kind of a bad dude. I guess we call him a terrorist today. The Bible describes he used to terrorize uh, certain parts of Israel. But it tells us that there's hope for 
everyone. There's hope for you. And so get this teaching here that undergirding all this, there's hope for every situation. There's hope where a relationship has run dry. There's hope in a family situation where it looks hopeless. If, if Naaman, the terrorist, could change, if Naaman, the emotional manipulator, could change, there's hope for everyone in your family. Let us believe God with you concerning that. Also, uh, just I want to mention to you that get a hold of this whole teaching, five hours. Uh, one of the things I'm not even touching on this week, we, one of the teaching aspects on these CDs is where I talk about five relationship time bombs, things that are there all along and you may not even notice them or you just notice them a little bit, but, but they are there like set to explode later on in the relationship. I think it'll really help you plus so much more. So the information is there, how you can receive it. And, and uh, yeah, you can also order it online. Let me take a moment. God loves the world. I, I never lose sight of that. I don't know. It's been with me from the time I first received the Lord. I, I go to a, any place where there's a crowd, I think about, do, do these people know Jesus? Have, have their eyes been open to Jesus? That's why we look at nations. And the nation of Sierra Leone caught my eye. West African nation, uh, certain facts. Number one, the civil war brought devastation. Terrible, you see some of the pictures there. Number two, the Ebola crisis and the epidemic killed so many people just more recently. Number three, I have never seen a country where Islam has grown so rapidly. 1960, you see the chart there, 35%. Today's 80%. That's enormous. I don't know any other country with such a shift in religious allegiance as in Sierra Leone. And yet you would think that there was animosity and that the religious different groups are fighting one another. They are not. We're going there. I'm going there to train 1,400 pastors in how to reach Muslim friends with the gospel. I'm going there in a big stadium. You see a picture of the stadium. I'll be preaching there. I, I need your help right now. And if you already are a VIP partner, I hope that you are rejoicing at this opportunity that God has given us to bring God's love to people who's been so devastated. And, it, and, and really the backbone of this is our VIP family. Watch this. It's a ministry with a heart as big as the whole wide world. It started in a small missions chapel. That fair first service, I just had one goal in mind that somebody would receive Christ as their Savior. I hoped to preach for 10 minutes, but I didn't last that long. I didn't have enough to say, but at the end of it, two people came to the Lord. The vision only grew stronger. And a couple of years later, Peter Youngren had moved to Providence, Rhode Island, Zion Bible Institute. It was during that time that I saw a vision and, and it, it changed my life. It, it put such a passion in me to touch the world with the gospel. In a way, I became like an untamed tiger. I just wanted to break out of the whatever confinement I was in. Sometimes that confinement was within the, the Christian church where we were so much about ourselves and reach out to those who had never known Jesus. That passion has continued unabated for 40 years with some of the largest gospel outreaches ever, especially in countries that are normally considered impossible. Just like the Apostle Paul, Peter seeks to gain a foothold for the gospel by first meeting with political and religious leaders Amazingly, God opens the heart of prime ministers, presidents, governors, and leaders of various religions. Friendship festivals are just that, events often held in large stadiums where the good news of Jesus Christ is presented uncompromisingly and yet in an attitude of respect and friendship towards all. Gospel Revolution seminars have impacted 356,000 leaders and counting, an extensive training that reintroduce pastors, bishops, and leaders to the simplicity and yet profound power of Christ's gospel. Through media, believers are enlisted in the cause of Christ, and many hear the gospel often for the very first time. The most recent media outreach, a 24-7 Christian television station in the world's largest Muslim city, is nothing short of a miracle. 
On an average, 2,000 Muslim friends respond to Christ every month, something unheard of in the Islamic world. But newborn believers, more than 16 million over the last 25 years, need nurturing. And so the teaching booklet, Salvation, God's Gift to You, becomes their first introduction to the Christian faith. All this, plus ongoing ministry in Israel, Bible schools in different parts of the world, long-term missionaries, and much more, is made possible by partners. Partnership is more than giving. It is people who stand shoulder to shoulder for the gospel. The VIP family are the monthly partners who form the backbone of the ministry. Because of the VIP family, we're able to say yes to the challenges that come to us because we know we have people who stand shoulder to shoulder uh, with this ministry and they believe like I believe that if everyone has a basic human right to hear the gospel. You know, it, it, it's a great tragedy to me that millions of people are born, they live and they die and never hear the gospel. But I'm thankful for the many who are rallying to the cause who have discovered that it's a real blessing to become involved with the gospel. And so thank you to the VIP family. Make your life count for souls, for eternity, for the gospel. Jesus said that when we give for his sake and for the gospels, we receive a maximum return. Truly those who bless Jesus Christ and his gospel are blessed. Call now, 1-877-974-7223 or give online at FeederYoungren.org. And you know what makes this work and these enormous crowds that come from people of all kinds of religions is that people, uh, they're not pushing God away. They, they already have this longing inside. The hunger is there. And what we do, we're not trying to, to, to push them in a direction they don't want to go. We're just opening their eyes to what Jesus has done. You know, that's what Jesus said to Saul of Tarsus or Paul the Apostle as he was called at that time. He says, I send you to open people's eyes. We're opening people's eyes to who God is, that God is love, that God is not this grotesque, petty, small, vindictive God, that God is love and that this love has been revealed in Jesus, in Jesus' action, in Jesus' death, in Jesus' resurrection. Oh, don't get me talking about that's what we're doing. And you help us make it happen. I need your help now. Please go to the phone. Please give online. Thank you so very, very much. You are so needed right now. God bless you. And remember, you are loved. Thank you. Your partnership makes this ministry possible. To share your prayer request or to help bring the good news of Jesus Christ to thousands who have never heard, call 1-877-974-7223. You can give at www.peteryoungren.org or send your gift to World Impact Ministries at PO Box 2108, Vista, California, 9205-2108 or 190 Railside Road, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, M3A 1A3. Together, let's give everyone a chance to hear the gospel.